Good morning. I am back in sunny, beautiful, hot, tropical Trinidad and Tobago. I'm back for court. When my very first video back, I have an exciting interview with Mr. GG, Gary Griffith Jr., uh, very well known. And let's say he's a famous man here in Trinidad and the far majority of you folks love him. It's an honor to talk to him. So I'm gonna get ready, have breakfast and head down into Port of Spain to meet the man, the myth, the legend and ask him all the questions I have about crime and peace and even if possible, I would love to hear his opinion on my charge of sedition. So that's all about to happen very soon. Do me a favor, if you're new to my channel and you enjoy travel content from around the world, hit that subscribe. I'm gonna give you three seconds right now to just, just to ensure that you do it for me. So I'm gonna pause, give it to you one, hit that subscribe, hit that subscribe. I'm on a mission to a million. So let me make my way downtown and the interview is about to start now. I'm sitting here with a gentleman that was most definitely the most requested on the channel. Uh, when I travel the world, I love to show every side of the story. It's an honor, Mr. Gary Griffith. Uh, and if you're from Trinidad, you already know who this gentleman is. Maybe you can, uh, <laughs> for those that don't know, uh, a small list of your accomplishments. Hi, good day to everyone. Tune in. Uh, my name is Gary Griffith, Gary Griffith Jr. Um, I was previously the Commissioner of Police from the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago from 2018 to 2021. Prior to that, I was also the Minister of National Security 2013 to 2015. Just before that, I was the National Security Advisor to Trinidad and Tobago from 2010 to 2013. And before that, I was my introduction in law enforcement. I was a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force for 17 years, retiring at the rank of captain. Wow, you look too young to have that long list of uh, accomplishments. There's a lot that Dai can actually do to, <laughs> to fool people. <laughs> My next question is, it's got to take, don't take this as an insult, but it's got to take a somewhat of a crazy man to want the, the role or position that you want. And Throughout my whole life, even when I was at secondary school, my life has always been to see if I can try to help others, those persons who need that support. I hate bullies, I hate bullying. And we even see the Prime Minister, he's the ultimate bully. And, but the, the, a bully is usually the biggest coward, and that's why he can never uh, confront me or face me or have an, even a conversation with me. And that's why he was intimidated by the things that I was doing. I know there has been, there have been a lot of issues that, as it pertains to gang activity in this country. Um, one of the concerns always would be the abuse of power. One thing I tried my best as Commissioner of Police was to make sure, even though there was fear, F-E-A-R, of Gary Griffith as a Commissioner, be wanting that every single person, whether whichever side of defense you're on, they will understand that I will also be fair, FAIR. And I think that is very critical. If it is that you are involved in law enforcement, even if that you have people on the other side of defense, you need to make sure you do not abuse your authority. I did everything that I could possibly do from put, implementing polygraph testing, drug testing, um, making sure that we can have um, police officers uh, involved in me working with the police complaint authority, and being able to monitor police officers closely through the, even implementing body cameras that would have never been there before. Certain things that could measure their performance, make them accountable and ensure that they will not abuse their authority whilst at the same time, if they operate in the use of force policy, they can be protected um, to make sure that they will not be wrongfully accused. Yeah, you know what, speaking, speaking about the body cameras, when I went to these different neighborhoods, the common denominator over and over again is the fear of police. Uh, there hasn't been one community I went to in which they did not have a list of people that had died. In a, it could have been a battle. It could. Have, I'm not there to to judge, but I mean, the, the the common conversation is why aren't those cameras not used? So maybe you can explain. Is not the law here to have the camera working at all times? Well, it is not law. So prior to maybe in commission of police things pertaining to police officers being polygraph tested, of police officers um, in being involved in drug testing, and the use of the body cameras, all that was, it was that, that never took place. I thought it was totally unacceptable because these were basic systems that could measure performance and make police officers accountable, as I mentioned. Right. So immediately, I put in those systems for polygraph testing for police officers, um, drug testing, and then as it pertained to body cameras, I couldn't believe that. In, when I'm speaking about, I got became commissioner in 2018. In 2018, police officers not having body cameras. Immediately, I, I was able to acquire over 1,000 body cameras, and that would be for over 7,000 police officers. That was more than enough 
that could have been provided because you don't need a body camera for every police officer. The body cameras will be there and we have a, a, what 70 odd stations. You have a thousand body cameras. It means that every single time police officers have to go on a patrol, a roadblock, issue a warrant, um, being involved in an operation, they can immediately make sure that they have those body cameras. And the body cameras, I, I did a massive campaign to, uh, to train police officers to understand this is not a witch hunt to monitor you, but to make sure that you can actually be protected when wrongfully accused by, by persons. So, and it was a win-win situation. So what I did is I put a standard operational procedure in a departmental order. That SOP in that departmental order made it mandatory that the police officer must wear it. So, it's a, and again, unfortunately, because of stupid politics, because of the hierarchy of the police service being um, cowards and not being able to stand firm on certain things, every single thing that I would have put in as a commissioner of police, it was shut down, dismantled, removed, inclusive of the body cameras. So when you hear the nonsense now, that the, the the hierarchy of the police they do not they, they do not know why the police are not using it. Any police there have been 30 police killings this year, and I'm not in any way to state that these police killings would have been um, not justified or, or whether the officers were right or wrong. But the body cameras should have been worn, and if the body cameras were, were worn, it means that anybody who will wrongfully accuse the officers, the officers will be protected. Right. And in the same manner, if the officers use excessive use of force they will now be disciplined because now we realize there was excessive use of force. So for them not using the body cameras, it's a lose-lose situation. I think it was totally unacceptable that the head of the Police Welfare Association can have the audacity to say that they do not have to give body camera footage or evidence to the PCA, it's not mandatory. That those are the things that cause the problem. I made sure like almost on a fortnightly basis I would meet with the police um, complaint authority. And those are the, the, the type of concerns that would cause public cost, trust and confidence in the police to yet, yet again go down. Initially, when I became commissioner, it was 14% public trust and confidence. When I left, it was 59%. So from the lowest trust and confidence in any arm of the public service, it became the highest. Just a year after I left, it went back down to 8%. And it's because of things like this, where it is that the body camera is there, it's a departmental order. If the officers do not use it, then they should immediately be suspended. So the heady hierarchy of the police stating, well, we do not know why they're not using it, is because of your failure to understand your role and function and to not take disciplinary action because they are breaching mandatory um, departmental orders based on the, on the standing orders that, that would have been published. Yes, you know. Me, I'm a strong believer in reverse engineering success. Now, if it's worked in countless states, cities, and countries around the world, why would it not work uh, to build the trust here in Trinidad? Uh, I've heard from every side. Um, you know, again, I've heard from the guys with guns that they want the camera on. They want accountability. I've also heard from the police officers on the street saying that, um, you know, sometimes the battery doesn't work. Sometimes the camera doesn't work. Or the longevity of the battery is not equal to the length of time they're out on the road. A lot of parents will tell me Trinidad is sort of the cause for this increase in crime. Some people like to listen to it before committing a crime. Um, I myself am not a strong believer that music is the reason. Uh, Roger Alexander said that he listens to Trinidad music and doesn't go commit a crime. But what are your thoughts? Uh, what role does this music play in Trinidad? Well, let me tell you, my son, uh, he was on the national football team. Uh, he has traveled, he has been playing football for a couple of years in the United Kingdom. When he came back home and I was commissioner of police, that commissioner's, that police commissioner's residence was almost like an adoption agency. We had about 20 young men in that house. And it was just to provide opportunities for these guys. Some of them were on the national football team, some of them. And these were, we're talking about Afro Trinidadian kids who probably didn't have a proper home. They, were, they, didn't, have, they didn't know where they were going to eat. And we provided that opportunity for them. And my son knew them well. And the, the type of music I heard, I, I couldn't understand what, it was being, what was being said. And I will hear that all night. And not one of these guys were bad guys. Not one of them ever broke the law. So this perception of, but let me tell you what happens. This is what happens when politicians and, and law enforcement heads, they do not have a clue how to reduce crime. So they blame society. They blame parents, they blame the community, they blame the laws, they blame music. They try to find everything under the sun instead of looking in the mirror to understand the responsibility is yours. So Ola Christopher, that's what she does now. Um, they try to, they, they, they say we need Jesus. No, focus on what you can do. Don't blame the music, don't blame, don't, don't blame society, don't blame parents, don't blame the community, don't blame teachers, don't blame the schools. Look at yourself and see what you could do. because. 
in 2018 to 2021, we had the same type of music being played. How come all of a sudden there was a there was some degree of it being of people calming down? Um, I remember I actually went on stage with, with Buju Banton. I was actually going to sing, but I, I would have made a fool of myself. <laughs> and I understood that, listen, being a commissioner of police, whether you're minister of national security, who knows, maybe I'll be prime minister one day. My job is to make sure I'm accessible, making sure that I can never be in a position that people will say, well, I can't see him, I can't speak to him, I can't communicate with him. So regardless of who you were, I, I will ask all persons, you want to be in leadership, make yourself accessible. Don't feel that after the election, you get in a position and they can't find you. And that's why even persons, young men who are involved in criminal activity, I will meet them in cells, I will talk to them, find out, for me to find out what is going wrong, what caused it. And that is what is what should be important. We have people called criminologists in this country. But a criminologist, their role and function is to go to prisons, interview young persons, find out what caused them to commit crime. They don't do that. What they do is they, they become law enforcement experts and talk total nonsense that totally skewed from the facts of what caused crime. And that is what should happen. We're supposed to be doing, having interviews, ex, ex, and, and, and then we'll understand that the majority of young persons who commit crime is not because they were born criminals. It's not because that they just that they just want to be bad. Sometimes it's just need for money. Sometimes they just bad company, um, bad decisions. Sometimes one bad decision leads to another. But if it is, we can pull it back. Get these young persons, and then when they are arrested, they go into prison. They then rub shoulders with the most hardened criminals sometimes they are they are, they are charged for a matter where the the maximum sentence is five years and they stay in prison for 10 years in remand or oh, it's our fault we need to see about it that is why my intention is to get back in a political sphere to be able to transform Trinidad and Tobago from the criminal justice system the, um, the the use of force policy better policing better communities making sure young people have that opportunity to that turn them away from a life of crime it is a lot of work but I mean, I, I worked 20 hours, 20 hours a day, seven days a week when I was commissioner of police. I ended up in the hospital on two occasions. There were 43 death threats on myself. And on most occasions, the individuals who made the death threats, when we found them, they apologized. And I realized it, they were, it, it was just, sometimes they, they use the screen to be big and bad. And I let every one of them know, hey, you can't do that. You cannot be going out there, threatening people, showing a firearm, and just keeping it controlled. We can fix this country. I give the country the assurance that what, this government has done by destroying what I did in three years, I could bring it back in three months, the day after general election. You know, when I was in Belize, I filmed very similar. Belize city is a lot smaller in population, 300,000 people, but crime is rampant, gangs rampant. Uh, after the first two weeks of me filming the gang members in the bad areas, uh, the University of Miami reached out to me. They're sending a team of criminologists down. They want to have lunch with me to discuss my findings. Not, not because they were embarrassed at what I filmed, but they said, you know, you, you're filming some, some information that we can actually utilize because we don't have the ability to go and talk to these gang members. Um, I hope this, this conversation that we had can be educational, not only for the people of Trinidad, but for the world. And I'm definitely going to share the information on my future trip. So greatly appreciate uh, your time and, and knowledge. And I can feel your passion. I am a full-time YouTuber. This is what I do every day of the week, and I've learned so much over the course of the last three years. So I put together an online course. It's ridiculously cheap. I mean, the cost is equal to like a, a pizza. So if you're interested in finding out more about YouTube and learn everything I got up here, then do me a favor down below. You're gonna find a, a link to my program slash course. Now's your chance. So I, I, I just wanna make this a better country. I mean, as yes. I close, going back to the criminologist, you ask any of them, how many prisoners have you interviewed? How many gang members have you interviewed? Yes. Zero. Yes. But they just wait on their phone, waiting for that call to take place from the media for them to say the most ridiculous things. Yes. So my job is will be continue to find a way just to make this a better country. Um, I intend to transform Trinidad and Tobago, and I intend to make Trinidad and Tobago safe again. I'm confident. And uh, presuming my case turns out all right and I'm allowed to come back for years and years to come, I would, it would be a... Uh, It'd be a great honor to see you in position uh, at the top. Yeah, well, definitely. Um, not, not as commissioner of police, being there, right. done that. So now I need to get back in a position where I can be involved in implementing laws, policies, to assist every arm of the protective service, making sure that they can be properly protected. I mean, we have situations now, and in fairness to the officers, I have police officers, there are police officers out there that they have bulletproof vests that are probably about 10 years old, which means that it would be defective. Um, I made requests for armored vehicles to protect police officers when they go into hotspot areas. It was rejected, but the politicians were able to bring in eight armored vehicles to protect themselves, and they're not the ones who are at risk. 
Um, and I, again, likewise, I will continue to double down on the importance of the body cameras. It is totally unacceptable. It is really childish that after you put a departmental order to make it mandatory for police officers to have the body cameras. And this, uh, again, I want to re-emphasize, almost 90% of the times when the police officers would be involved in a, some type of a firefight, they were in their right. But, and that's what the body cameras will do. The body cameras will protect them from being wrongfully accused. If they don't have the body cameras, they may very well face a manslaughter charge because four or five people can make a false um, statement about them. The body cameras did protect them. And it wasn't just the body cameras. What I actually did, I, um, even in cities in the United States, did not have that. I actually put dashboard cameras on the vehicles themselves to provide real-time video footage fed back to a national operations center. And all of this was to ensure proper accountability and to measure the performance of the police officers. Um, I, one, when I became commissioner, I was not, and I will never be somebody who will be somebody there to abuse authority. And I think because of that, even the criminal elements, they had a degree of respect for me because they understood that even though you're on this other side of the fence, if it is that you're involved in something wrong, I would come after you. I will not abuse my authority. We have had, we had so many allegations of, of police brutality. And at least with myself, I will make sure that regardless of who you are, you will, you, there, there must be a degree of fairness, a degree of transparency. And because of that, even the criminal elements, they had that degree of respect for me. It wasn't that I was a, the biggest gang leader, but because I had the biggest, my numerical superiority is what caused a lot of the, the gangs to realize, look, we need to back off because I had a structure. I had a structure by the Special Operation Response Team, the National Operations Center, a revamping the 999 unit, making sure we had the body cameras, um, even started putting pepper spray tasers, different things to ensure the minimum use of force. I couldn't understand before that a police officer will use verbal persuasion and after that he had to use his firearm. I started putting the, the battle, the, com the radios for communication to ensure backup but because that numerical superiority will, will, will try to calm down any confrontation. Tasers, pepper spray, those are the type of things that will ensure that you will not have to reach to that concept of a police officer having to use his firearm. The, the criminal elements, uh, um, well, let me put the gangs themselves. A lot of the gangs had this concern because they will be invading each other's territory. What I did is I took control of the area where I said, look, if, this, if, if no neighborhood, no area must belong to a gang. And by doing that, I was protecting every citizen of this country, whether you're a gang member or not. And by doing, because many gangs, when, that, when I spoke to, to them, when it is that they were, they were held, they will say, well, but the boss man, we have no choice. We are trying to protect our two from this gang. So what I did is I became that godfather to put heavy resources into those areas to make sure that this gang cannot and should not invade another territory of another gang and vice versa. Whilst at the same time, if we find situ situations such as illegal weapons or, or some criminal act, you would be arrested. So by me doing that, it, may, it meant that the gangs felt a degree of protection in their own environment and not having to invade others. Yeah. It ensured other gang, gangs as well, certain things that have taken place now, such as extortion, um, home invasion, kidnapping, all of that was a thing of the past. We were able to, it, it never happened before, where we actually solved 12 kidnappings. We're hearing comments now about the kidnapping um, was solved. It's not, you paying the ransom is not, is not solving. What we did is we actually kicking down doors finding the kidnappers and rescuing the victim on 12 occasions that happened using the type of technology that I had from being involved in getting into the dark web, covert operatives, NYPD for example, they got 35,000 police officers, about 2,000 of them, the other 33 don't know, they drive taxis, they sell hot dogs, so might be putting persons in the underworld having covert operatives, making sure the public has had full access to me, even the criminal elements having full access to me, if at any time there was a police involved in wrongful activity, I would be able to deal with it and also make sure that the criminal and the gangs themselves would hold, even if you hold your area, you cannot invade another territory and you know that there's not going to be a concern of others coming into your territory. Whilst at the same time, whilst not to say that I'm protecting them, but I'm preventing that war because I was providing that degree of security and it provided that, it minimized that problem of what is known as collateral damage where, where sometimes there'll be gang warfare and somebody, as an innocent citizen, is in the wrong place at the wrong time. If you go on Arapita Avenue on a Friday night when I was commissioner of police, people complained they were seeing too many vehicles, too many blue lights. High visibility caused many persons to calm down. I was able to bring it down. So my last year as commissioner of police, we were down to less than 340 meters for the year. It kept going down 
had I continued my my the aim was to go to less than 150 and that would be as good as it gets um, the 150 the last time we had that was 20 plus years ago before the problems with gang related activity legal weapons came in this can't turn around it's, it is not difficult the country is, is right now there's a high degree of um, persons losing all degree of confidence but I was if I was able to turn around the police service that was seen as the least trusted to be the most trusted we can turn around Trinidad and Tobago. There's a lot that we can do. Um, I, I am aware of the major concerns of young men turning into gang warfare. It is because of lack of opportunities. It's not a justification, but instead of giving uh, a gang leader $5 million to build a $200,000 box train, you, you put systems to try to provide opportunities for young men so they will not turn to a life of crime. It is known as secondary crime prevention, where their energies can be utilized in the right manner. We have sport, for example. Not one person in this present government has ever played sport of any nature, so they don't understand. I have been on national teams for years, representing my country in the Central American and Caribbean Games, Pan American Games, Commonwealth Games, World Cup qualifiers. I think I was the first manager to lead a, a, a national team abroad in a World Cup to qualify for a World Cup, even before the national football team. So I know the importance of sport. Um, I built an AstroTurf in St. James Barracks three years since I left. It has not been touched. And these are the facilities that can be used to turn young people away from a life of crime. Sport, better education, better opportunities for employment, making sure that they will not be profiled by, by citizens' law enforcement. And again, when we look at what has happened now with this Prime Minister, when he's speaking about trying to remove the shackles of colonialism, instead of doing it by removing three ships, you could do it by simple things that are not taking place now. Let me hit you with some. Lo and behold, Trinidad and Tobago still has a law called loitering. That was something that was put in the 1930s to suppress the masses because of limited number of police officers. It was then known as the Trinidad and Tobago Police Force. So if two young guys are on a street corner, they can be arrested. We have another law that allows police officers, based on probable cause, which is just how they feel, based on sometimes profiling, it immediately, it immediately can cause police officers to um, to search any vehicle, which is a breach of your, of your privacy. Your vehicle should be similar to that of, of your house, where you need a warrant. We have situations where a police officer can charge somebody for known as annoying language. So if you argue with a police officer, you can be arrested. All of these type of laws are totally draconian. They are totally outdated, even as it pertains to firearms, the issue of firearms. I find there should be a right for persons to bear arms. We cannot have it because of the colonial system that has limited persons' capability to have a firearm to protect themselves, to stop their wife from being killed, their daughter from being kidnapped, their son, um, their, their son from being robbed. So all of these colonial, outdated laws that we presently have, those are the laws that should be removed because it has, it did, those are the things that have shackled us and sometimes there is that degree of profiling by police officers and it is unfortunate and because of that degree of profiling it may cause certain degree of um, disrespect of the police service but it can change because these are the same police officers just three years ago that there was immense trust and confidence in police people started looking forward to seeing police in roadblocks and so forth because we had systems to measure their performance and make them accountable you sort of touched upon outdated laws what are your thought on sedition this sedition is a word i never heard prior to uh my meeting here with the police what, what are your thoughts uh, from my understanding, nobody has ever been convicted of sedition. It's a, the present law, it is so broad, it is similar to the laws I mentioned where are using abusive or annoying language. Mm -hmm. So if someone argues with a police officer, he can, he can be arrested here. It is wrong because it is all based on, it's subjective, it's based on public perception, police perception. Yeah. And sometimes even with sedition, how our law is drafted, it's, that is such a way, how you interpret it is how the police officer can charge you. And yeah. then... When you go to court, the court will, when they analyze it from, from looking at it from a subjective perspective based on the judge now, he will have something totally different. And then what happens is that the court now will find the person not guilty and then the individual might now um, be reimbursed hundreds of thousands of, if not millions of dollars, thanks to, and the taxpayer will have to foot the bill. Yeah. So it's obviously, these are laws that need to be properly looked at. I am also, I'm very, very, um, there's, it's non-negotiable when it comes to individuals involved in terrorism, um, persons who may be involved in criminal activity. So in the same way where it is, I stated that 
that sedition is something that you have to be very careful. It can't be somebody just making a comment and you automatically use that as an avenue to target them. But in the same manner, if so, I have always said, and I said it before, if we want to put an end to criminal activity, someone caught with an automatic weapon, that person can kill 35 persons in three seconds. If that is not deemed a terrorist, I don't know what is. It means that that individual should be charged for terrorism, making it a capital offense, non-bailable, and then he'll be incarcerated for 20 years plus. Instead, um, criminal elements, they know they can have an automatic weapon, they, they will be held, they can get $50,000 bail, leave, then go out now to probably put a hit on somebody to have to pay the bill. It's ridiculous. And when I mentioned this to this prime minister, he scoffed at it. And it makes you wonder if the state, whether it is that they, they, the scales of justice have been so tilted against the law abiding citizens. It is unbelievable. Whilst at the same time, we have these outdated colonial laws that I just mentioned that, that should be changed. They must be changed because these colonial laws were made deliberately to shackle and to, and to control the masses because of the limited numbers of law enforcement we had in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Those things must change because those things can be used by a police officer wrongfully. Yeah, uh, what's amazing is sitting across the table from somebody so passionate, uh, it doesn't happen so often. I can see already why the majority of the public loves you. Uh, I can see already everything you're speaking about is in regards to peace, um, no matter who you are. Let's talk about peace a little bit. I think one of the reasons why I got in trouble with the law here is because Trinidad, amongst Trinidadians, um, it's very well known that crime is a problem. But my platform brought crime outside of Trinidad. Now the world is seeing the problem. There's no doubt there's a problem here when it comes to crime. I'm sure your whole career you've been trying to make that step forward to reduce crime. What can be done sort of like step by step today Maybe I can even take the knowledge and when I go to other countries with high crime, I can share what I've learned. But what, what is sort of like the general one, two, three steps forward to reduce crime in Trinidad? Well, crime is a product of opportunity. The greater the deterrent, the less likely that persons will commit the crime because now they know there's a greater possibility of them being apprehended. That's basic criminological theory. So what I did is I pushed high visibility, a rapid response, a heavy deterrent and put away that product of opportunity. It made it more difficult for the individuals. So there will be these um, memes a few moments later. An individual can't go on a screen and then say that I have a firearm and boast about it. He knows that I will immediately I'll be able to find him. Through the technology I had, whether it involves someone using a firearm, someone involved in kidnapping, home invasion, you jump over that wall, by the time you come back over, we will be there. So there was that heavy policing, but there's also that, that is just one piece. There's also the aspect of making sure that the persons who have that authority must be controlled. When they have that control, it means even the, those people on the other side of the law will have no respect for the police. So it is not a matter of let us target these officers because they are involved in abusing their authority. So that's why there was that degree, there was that degree of respect that the, 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 those on the other side of the law had for me. Um, what I find very hypocritical is, is persons trying to, well, even like yourself, they will try to say, well, you have exposed the problems of Trinidad and Tobago. You cannot get more in exposing than a prime minister telling the whole, whole world that our main intelligence body, which was the equivalent to the CIA, were involved in a cult, that they were involved in terrorist attempts, that they were involved in a possible coup and to destabilize the country. He made that comment. So he went out in public and made the most stupid comment ever without any evidence, any witnesses, no one arrested on any of those things. So why will anyone in this the world want to invest in Trinidad and Tobago? So you know, when they accuse individuals of exposing the, um, the dirty linen of Trinidad and Tobago, he did it. And he did it without any facts because from what we gather so far, it is not true. And he's too, I think sometimes people may need to look in the mirror before they accuse others. Having said that, um, I, my, my style has always been not to hide something. If there's an issue, hiding it and not letting the world know, that doesn't solve anything. What we need to do is to show, look, we have a problem and we can deal with it. We would deal with it. Hopefully, the day after the next general election, I will be in that position of authority to fix this country, to clean up this country. What will that title be? Your title? God knows what it would be, but okay. it, it wouldn't be Commissioner of Police. Um, previously, when I was Minister of National Security, it was the highest reduction in serious crime in 31 years. Every single serious crime was reduced. As Commissioner of Police, it was the highest reduction in violent crime in 17 years. So, and it wasn't because of me being big and bad, 
but making sure I could find a way to just to calm the temperature. People just calm down, let's deal with it piece by piece. And the public started trusting the police, the police started feeling good about themselves, the criminal elements started backing off, um, individuals started staying in their, in their zone, and we started seeing the difference. People felt the difference. Um, national security, or I should say crime, became the number four concern behind health, education, and the economy. Now it's back up to number one, all thanks to Keith Rowley. So hopefully with this next general election, it will give me that opportunity to totally restructure the police service, transform them as I did, not just the police service, the prisons, the customs, the immigration, the fire, the army, the, the police, the coast guard, all arms of the protective services. And in the same way, I intend to do the same in every arm in the public service by certain a principle of accountability, good management, measuring performance. Uh, and by doing that, it will make sure that persons stay in their lane, they do what, it, what is required, they do not abuse their authority, whilst those people who want to be on the other side of the law, we can now make sure that they understand there are going to be repercussions because we have the biggest, um, based on numerical superiority, you're not going to win. Whilst at the same time, understanding that young persons, they don't just, they're not born criminals. Many of them feel, feel that they are being sidelined, they are being profiled by the authorities, they are not given the opportunity um, that they feel that they should. And by doing that, if it is that I could provide resources, training, education, putting, turning the energy away from a life of crime, it will play a very big part towards assisting the communities. That is why I, I was involved in um, something known as the Commissioner's Cup. We had gangs in certain communities. There's one gang versus another gang in two communities. I said, you want a battle? We're on a football field. And the, and the young persons in the different communities went on the field and the gang leaders and were, were on the sideline and they started understanding, yeah, let's deal with our battle in sport rather than with a firearm. That's why sport can be a major tool to transform a country to reduce crime. Look at what happened in the last two Olympics. Not a medal, nothing. Because we have moved from being gold medalists, hopefully to be um, uh, medalists, then from medalists to be finalists. Now we're hoping to be qualifiers because they've put no support, no structure, no assistance in trying to push uh, sport. And I'm not just talking about to, for people to be world class, but in the communities, making sure that there'll be proper fields, proper training, proper supervision, getting young persons to burn that energy that they have away from a life of crime into probably sport, education, and just giving them that opportunity. They have that opportunity, they believe that somebody's listening to them it will provide them, and I'm not speaking about, about government contracts that give them millions in, in markup. I'm talking about giving young men and women just an opportunity to survive. And if they do that, it is going to take away many of them away from a life of crime. Yeah, you know, I was, I was walking through Beatum uh, with Plumpy Boss and a bunch of people, and I asked them in general, what would the first step be towards bringing some peace to the community? And one gentleman spoke and said, you know what the kids would really love? Maybe a former football player to come by once a week or once every two weeks and, and just show them that there's other opportunities. I'll tell you what, no matter which area I went to with guns, everyone spoke the same and said, look, if that other person down there wasn't gonna come and take this, I wouldn't need to be holding this gun. And I'm not justifying what they do in any sense. My whole goal is to start a conversation speak to people like yourselves much smarter than me uh, on the subject and I think together there's got to be a way to make it uh, a more peaceful country because I love Trinidad I like I've never in my life felt so much love and welcoming even when nobody knew who I was my first day as I walked down the street the smiles and the warmth of the people I don't think people will, will understand it when all they're thinking about and hearing about on TV is uh, uh, yeah. that's CJ oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know uh, how, how much higher but, I could speak about Trinidad. Uh, I, I wish I had a special power to get you uh, in, into the place you deserve to be because I know from speaking to people on the street, speaking to people on the street, that you deserve uh, that role. Well, but there are two points that you just mentioned there. Um, the first one, definitely, which is what I did. When I started doing research, I realized, and this is not in any way to justify what these gangs have done. They're wrong, yes. they're having illegal weapons. But then when I did the research, I realized many of them were stating, I had to, to have my, my arsenal, I have to form my defense because of fear that this gang will come and invade my area. And that's why, so when I moved in there with the police service and I turned the, uh, the police service into a virtual army, not to, in, not to invade and to attack, but to defend. So I was here to defend this, proper, this property from that and vice versa. 
if some if there was a shooting, I wouldn't immediately just invade the place that was that was shot uh, or the person that was killed. I will go to the other area to prevent the retaliation that would take place. So I was very scientific, I was very tactical, I was very strategic, whilst not abusing my authority. And and because of that, the, a lot of the gang started in here. He is providing the protection that I need because of my fear, whether perceived or not. Because of that, fear was justifying why they had it. And I said, that is not the justification. If I find you with an illegal firearm, we are going to take you down and take you out. Right, right. But in the same manner, if there's that, they are mortified about retaliation, they will continue to build their arsenal. And when they build it, that's what causes the problem. So I went in there and I started making sure that, that Gang A could not go and in, infiltrate into Gang B. And it meant that Gang B, if there was infiltration, I would make sure that Gang A would not be, would not be um, invaded. And that is where all of a sudden from, we had to we to 320 odd murders for a year, in my last year, from August 2020 to August 21. We are now going to over 600, we are setting right now to 650 this year. It's almost doubled. Double, yeah. And it could work. Also, when I, what I noticed, and I met with many of these gang leaders, and it, it, this may be a very strange comment, but these individuals were brilliant young men, and I understood that. And then I realized, and I kept, if it is they use their talent, instead of trying to pretend that you're a lieutenant or a, a general in an army, turn your leadership into trying to influence young men away from a life of crime. Because many of them, they have that charisma, they have the leadership, ed, leadership yeah. that can easily influence a naive young man to join a gang. But instead of doing that, try to turn the community into something so good and powerful based on your leadership, based on your, your, your charisma that you can influence young men to follow you. Let them follow you, not to, not to their debts, not to crime, but to follow you into doing something that can make their lifestyle better. And that's a, so what I noticed many of these gang members, how they, they, they control the communities. I realized the type, the talent that they had. Talent of leadership is something that is, it is plain you. There's no, you, you, there's not, you, you can't, sometimes people try to train yourself into being a great leader. No, I believe you're born. You're, you're born, born yeah. And these yes. individuals have that. My intention was to get these gang members, if it is I don't arrest you or take you out, if it is that you can utilize your energy away from a life of crime and use your leadership to build your community, enhance and give these young people opportunities rather than give them a death sentence. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm glad that you touched upon this. Well, my general findings, you know, I've been to Haiti. I've been into like the depth of Haiti's gang war. I find them as like hardened killers that are too far gone. There's no rehabilitation in my mind. Although you hope that most people can be re rehabilitated. But what I find when I go in these communities, a lot of young, I won't even call them men, even though they might be of age, they're still young boys um, that are not too far gone. You know, a lot of them, before I start filming, I feel the hesitation in their voice, like, what should I say? Yeah. Uh, they're not who they perceive to be. Even these Trini Bad artists that they're on TV or they're in videos with guns and the lyrics are very murderous. In reality, they're scared children. Um, like, they're, I can feel their heart when they talk to me. <laughs> and I'm like, man, like, why are you putting yourself in such a, like, you're putting a target on your back for a little bit of fame, right? But I've never, I never grew up like them so it's hard for me to speak on somebody's behalf when I don't understand but I would say that 95% of these guys I met even the ones with the guns I would invite them this might be hard for people to because I know they're committing crimes but I would still invite them to dinner and not worry about them doing something to me not to say they're not doing stuff so I guess long-windedly I'm trying to say that I feel Trinidad has that opportunity to bounce back but definitely there's got to be some direction and opportunity because the word that I've heard over and over again amongst these people in the community is stigma. Mm -hmm. Chris, I have the stigma. I, I try to get a job and my resume has this address or somebody finds out I'm from here. Even a military officer told me that. Like, he won't get promoted because he's, or his brother was a former well-known gangster and everybody in his class has been promoted X number of times and I'm sitting at a position because I was born in a certain neighborhood, right? So I think stigma is something, I don't know how you remove it or how you fix it, but it's just, it's something I've heard over and over and over again. Yeah, it's, it's hard to remove, it's profiling. And I, I am not ashamed, I mean, even the, the young lady who was arrested by myself in West Moorings was related to me. She's my second cousin or something. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest, gang, a major gang, uh, gang leader um, 
in Trinidad and Tobago, he is somebody that is related to me as well. So I have family who have been involved in criminal activity. It doesn't, if somebody could smear my name and character because they said, because of who I may be related to, second cousin or whatever. Well, they, they, that's, that's profiling. That is, it is very unfortunate. Um, I don't know why it is that people will continue to go down that road. Uh, I, I've seen so, so many young men, as I said, they, when it is that they have these videos and you hear these things, and they play, they play this big bad person. And then as soon as my boys, you hear Gary boys turn up. And then you hear a few moments later, and they're apologizing and they're scared, they're yeah. panicking. I see the same, I yeah. feel the same. And, and it happens even when I went to see lots when, during the, um, the COVID period, there was public health regulations, 20 young boys were on the beach. They were breaking the law. So people compared me and they said they were on the ground. That's what you gotta do, duh, educate yourself about law enforcement. If you got three police officers and 20 persons running around breaking the law, you do not know if they have a firearm. The first thing you gotta do is get them all to lie down because you don't know who has a firearm. When we, I'm sorry, we don't check to see if you have a, a birth certificate at the time. When we checked everything, I realized these were minors and they could all be arrested. What I did instead, I put them on the police bus and I had a one hour conversation with them, explained to them what happened, let them know the dangers of this. This could affect their life, it, could, it takes away the opportunity for them having a certificate of character had I arrested them. And I let them all out and, and their parents thanked me for it. And that is the type of policing that we need. We need that type of policing where, where persons can understand. Sometimes you just need to be flexible. You need to understand that these young men or women, you, you take that one, that wrong road, that one wrong road. And sometimes there's no coming back and it just becomes quicksand. They keep fighting up, fighting up to get out. My intention is to find an avenue for these individuals to get away from a life of crime. Get them to understand that there are opportunities that the country, uh, we are here to help you. We're not here to profile you. The profiling, as I mentioned, the loitering law, where two, two young men could be at a corner and automatically be arrested. Somebody will argue the police officer they could be arrested now for, for annoying language, where it is you can actually go into a vehicle and just because you profile the individuals and there's no, there's no probable cause. Those are the things, if we remove that, it allows many people to understand, yeah, there's no abuse of authority by the police. Whilst this is not in any way, this doesn't diminish, diminish the powers of police officers here, but we have major colonial laws that have caused citizens to be intimidated by the police, which is why I continue to go back to what we started, the importance of the body cameras. So all of these things have become serious concerns. The gang leaders themselves, as I said, if it is that they can utilize their energies in the right manner. I always told them that, I said, listen, if I find you with weapons, if I find you involved in criminal activity, I'm going to take you down. But in the same manner, until then, use your energies, your capability, your leadership, your strength, what God has given you, that gift of allowing people to believe in you, Use it in the right manner. See if you can save a life rather than costing someone their life. Yeah. So you're a strong believer this this can bounce back? Yeah, definitely. All it requires is the political will. Unfortunately, because of politics, Keith Rowley has, and the instructions of the government is to shut down and dismantle every single thing that I would have implemented. Uh, my intention, obviously, is to make sure that people will not be bullied, that they, they cannot be abused, which is why, as I said, when I put things such as the body cameras, pepper spray, teasers, uh, making sure that polygraph testing can be done for police officers. I put that for it to Gary. I was just crazy. I mean, I allowed any citizen to be able to have immediate contact with me. By me doing that, a police officer will know that if it is that I abuse someone in a roadblock, I, I, I um, break into someone's home without a warrant, so that person can just call the commissioner and blow on me who I'll be in his office the next day. No police officer now has that concern. They believe that they can see what they want, do what they want. And it is, again, this is not in any way to discredit the police service. These are darn good officers. They put their lives on the line. 31 of them lost their lives during COVID. Whereas in other countries, we had so many police officers abandoning their posts, abusing their authority. Not one incident during COVID we had of police officers kicking down doors, abusing their authority. Even if the prime minister foolishly tried to to allude to the fact that we should arrest people in their homes and I had to stand up to him to put him in his place because of his ignorance and not understanding the law because you could not break into homes and arrest people during COVID because it was known as the public health regulations and you couldn't arrest people in their private property. Those are the things that I find persons who hold office should stand firm on. Understand the constitution, understand the law. You don't work for man, you work for your God because that's when you saw your oath. And that's how I have operated, which is why what's which started the initial fall up in me and keep rolling. Senseless killing is going on. They're taking the money and killing people. And it didn't make any sense because they could take that money and help people. 
than they kill people, senseless killing. So Gaza trying to stop that kind of canal knowledge and make sure well the world could help Somali take that money and help people instead of you investing it in war and killing them for it's hard to live and it's easy to die yeah. and you living in a world that nobody don't like nobody and we trying to get the world to come back together and love the children and love every human on this earth and that to stop that because they investing money in war and that ain't making sense. Senseless killing. You understand? They're not normal. That is no normal behavior because if they're normal, they save life and take life. It's only God could take life. And God could save life. And we as human beings, we have to look out for the black brother and the black sisters. You understand? Everybody's Africa. Whether you're white, whether you're black, everybody's Africa. Because I get the money and that me and what's up and I beg in. And them get the money from here and take it and ain't give me nothing and the little we have in the pocket is still trying to get it and I tell the police leave all the blood 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 cribs, Utica, Sterling, Eastern Parkway, Carroll Street, Mud Avenue, Foster Avenue, Delaware, Prospect Park, Eastern Parkway. Because my friend, I gotta go, my driver's normal. gonna go. But yeah. I'm gonna see you again. I'm here for a couple weeks. You gotta remember my name. What's my name? Chris. Because you know I'm going to see you again and That's again. Is your ride? I want to pick you up. No, it's not my ride. Somebody's right. driving me. Yeah, what's your next one? Of course. You put your hand, right? Of course. Uh, right. You might uh, I want to sing a song. I, uh, I want to sing a song. Yeah, I got it. Quick. Okay. Yari yari yari, only in Gaza, no di yari, only in ghetto ghetto Gaza, you know di yari. They're not normal. They're not normal. Down in the Gaza, yari only. Yari only in yari, you know how hard it's a whole day yari. Ghetto ghetto Gaza. You wrote that part. We talking hard, been Latinized, been Latin nation. Saddam Hussein, they can say what they say. And Kaita nation, whoa, mongoose, dog in the yard. The queen, we love she bad. President Reagan died, pressed out the whole army. George Bush died. First Prime Minister, Trinidad and Tobago was Booms. Then Dr. Ike William. Then George Bush. Then Robinson. Then Patrick Manning. And as I say, they say the richest country is Trinidad because if you go in Africa, you must pass Trinidad water. Whether you go in Venezuela, you must pass through Trinidad water. You go in France, Dominica, you go in Haiti, you must pass through Trinidad water. And all the money stored in here and we soldiers, they ain't fear dead because when they're wounded, they post a point in Robert's path one time. Don't let the womb heal. My and friend, then I'm you so sorry, I gotta run. I'm gonna see you again. What's your name anyway? Sean Brown Kendall Brown, Remember, Remember me. Remember me, Chris. Yeah, because I have to me in the face. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 26th of July, my birthday born, 1964. Sean Brown Kendall Brown. I spent all my life with me. Nice to meet you. Right. All right? Yeah. Yes. Remember my name. Love in the house. Yes. 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 I see, I see. You know, some people think I stick a camera in his face but he wants me he's like put the camera put the camera in my <laughs> so Sean every time I see him I give him money he never asked for too much it's enough to buy a meal and I told him you don't have to ask I'm gonna give you the money anyway